Hello there, explorers. Today we are coming to you from the wild, tamed wilderness of Disney's Animal Kingdom. Disney and Disney World is the master of immersive entertainment and Animal Kingdom since its very beginning has been bringing us to these immersive worlds that honor our own by bringing real life continents like Asia and Africa to Central Florida here with impressive believability. There is one land though in Animal Kingdom that stands supreme to me as far as imagineering and storytelling prowess goes. It's the it's the coup de gras of immersive entertainment in Animal Kingdom. And no, I'm not talking about this one. I'm talking about this one. Hear me out. This is mostly hyperbole, I think. I think. I genuinely believe that Dino Land USA is almost always misunderstood. Dino Land USA, upon a closer inspection, actually has a really rich backstory. And I think that when viewed through this lens, it makes it one of the most interesting places in all of Animal Kingdom. But why Dino Land? Dino Land USA, the moderately trafficked section of Disney's Animal Kingdom, often elicits a shrug of indifference from many a Walt Disney World enthusiast. Some park goers are quick to dismiss the land as a cheap attempt to add even cheaper attractions to bulk up park offerings. These claims are hard to argue considering that each experience in Dino Land USA is a near copy of other attractions in the country, even in Disney parks. Its three main experiences are Triceratops Spin, a traditional spinning flat ride a la Dumbo the Flying Elephant and Astro Orbiter, the Primeval Whirl, a slightly less than generic wild mouse ride a la Goofy Sky School in Disneyland, and Dinosaur, the land's signature attraction that models Disneyland's Indiana Jones Adventure track and ride system almost completely. Animal Kingdom, when it was announced, was a much grander, much more ambitious project than what Disney could really afford at the time. And as construction progressed, many cutbacks were made to the original vision. One of the most lamentable aspects of the original Animal Kingdom concept was the Beastly Kingdom, a whole section of the park devoted to mythical creatures. There would have been a fantastical dragon coaster, and it would have had a unicorn animatronic, and even a Fantasia dark ride. Development got pretty far along and the concepts for the Beastly Kingdom still adorn the entrance and park logo, and remnants of what could have been remain scattered in that original space. Ultimately, the project got too big for what was reasonably attainable before a park opening, and rather than adapting the land, that section of the park was cancelled altogether, eventually opening up as Camp Mini Mickey on opening day, a much tamer, plainer alternative, and essentially a glorified meet and greet center. In absence of these mythical creatures, Imagineers aim to shift their focus to another option. Dinosaurs. Perhaps these true life creatures that once roamed the Earth could inspire a similar response as the Beastly Kingdom. And on top of all of that, dinosaurs were so in in the late 90s. Jurassic Park was still relatively fresh in the minds of the culture and just across town Universal Studios had recently opened Jurassic Park The Ride. Disney and Michael Eisner no doubt wanting to capitalize on the movement already had a dinosaur themed feature in the works at Walt Disney Animation. Perhaps Animal Kingdom would be a good venue to market the upcoming film and promote the wonder of dinosaurs with a touch of that Disney magic. And so Dino Land USA under a much tighter budget came to be. On the surface, a junky substitute to the Beastly Kingdom, but on a closer look, which we're about to do, you'll find that Dino Land USA is one of the greatest examples to me of how amazingly Disney crafts its stories in the park. And even when held within high budgetary constraints and disappointment even, Imagineers still get the job done. So Dinoland USA as a whole unintentionally became the ultimate exercise in Walt Disney Imagineering. Obviously our ultimate hope is that Imagineers have a steady flow, a steady stream of cash so they can always complete their vision. But here in Dinoland USA we find that a lack of funds doesn't necessarily stifle creativity. In fact, it might even enhance it. Dinoland USA is a fully rich environment with a rich and detailed and funny backstory. We begin our story here at the old fishing lodge where the seeds of Dinoland USA began to sprout. The story of Dinoland begins in the 1940s, in the middle of nowhere county called Diggs. Along the somewhat traveled American Highway 498 was a quaint fishing lodge, just along the deep and wide Discovery River that occasionally brought fishermen from all around to cast their rods in pursuit of the perfect catch. 
The fact that 498 could also represent April 1998, the month and year that Animal Kingdom opened, is likely purely coincidence. Near the fishing lodge were the hardworking duo Chester and Hester, an enterprising couple who bought a patch of property next to the stretch of developing highway as it was being paved. Anticipating travelers and wanderers along this new avenue of open road, Chester and Hester launched, owned, and operated their own gas station and general store with a focus of benefiting these motoring passerbys. Things were quiet, things were regular, and that was all. Until... 1947. In 1947, a novice archaeologist was passing through digs and spent the night at the lodge. While putzing around the building, he noticed and began uncovering what would become one of the most shaping moments of Diggs County ever. It was a dinosaur fossil. He parceled up his finding and carefully delivered his treasure to a group of scientists and paleontological friends of his, including one Dr. Bernard Dunn, all of whom confirmed his antiquity. Certain that more prehistoric relics were buried underneath the ground at the fishing lodge, he and several other paleontologists, including Dr. Dunn, united together to purchase the fledgling fishing lodge and begin the greatest adventure of all, excavation. Immediately, the paleontologist team seemed to strike the mother load and began unearthing the king of beasts itself, the full body bones of a Tyrannosaurus rex. This original find is still on display in the boneyard today, still packed neatly within the sediment. Popularity of the site grew in the paleontologist community and brought to Diggs County an eclectic group of scientists and curious archaeology students. And in 1949, Dr. Bernard Dunn officially established the Dino Institute within the walls of the fishing lodge. From the beginning, the hallmarks of the Dino Institute's celebrated focus would be exploration, excavation, and exaltation. Here at the Dino Institute, students could come and be able to obtain hands-on education in the constantly evolving world of dinosaurs. The Dino Institute would go on to award many internships to those who proved their enthusiasm. As the dig site grew, so grew the boneyard discoveries. As many fossils were unearthed, they were moved to the lodge where they were put on display for the students to study in their free time. But what soon followed was a unique interest from those not a part of the dino community to see the findings. The digs were never cheap to finance, so as a way to subsidize costs, the Dino Institute then opened their doors and in-house cafeteria to the public for a special fee, utilizing the lodge as a makeshift museum, visitor center, and restaurant for people to stop by and see. Word of the Institute continued to spread, and soon folks from all over were stopping by to see what all the hubbub was about. Travelers could see the fossils and bones on display as well as venture into the boneyard itself, still to this day an active dig site, and even assist in some of the discoveries themselves. This whole space was a hidden gem along Highway 498. Soon the influx of students, teachers, and curious interstate adventurers would become too much for the Dino Institute to withhold, and additions to the lodge would become necessary. These add-ons would facilitate the Institute's housing needs, its maintenance needs, and promote general camaraderie among the students. A Quonset hut was added as a maintenance bay for many of the vehicles. If you need a timeline of when these add-ons occur, take note of the telephone styles. There are several within the lodge and each become more modern as you wander throughout. There's extra tents for storage and cleaning the newly uncovered bones. There's a room that can quickly be converted to a bone plastering station if needed, and the whole lodge itself is very much a dormitory. And it's very quick to see that the interns are having a great time at the Institute, a light-hearted environment full of unique discoveries and traditions. Perhaps this is most evident in the hip joint, an additional segment added to the lodge. Here's where you'll find playful awards that have been bestowed to each other by the students, including the Golden Boot and the Zip Awards, awards given to hardworking paleontologists who still manage to come up with Zip. This hangout spot is equipped with a jukebox that offers Dino Land appropriate ditties. Another tradition appears to be upon completion at the Institute, students will find and personalize a rock with a special, often humorous message to leave behind. 
There's a unique relationship between staff and student here. Dr. Dunn, the straight-laced dig chief and lecturer, demands of his students a sense of prestige, while students like Mark Rios, who also goes by Animal, just want to have a good time, perhaps leading the cause for humorous vandalization by the students throughout the entire campus. Fun and games aside, though, you can see throughout the original Institute is a healthy appreciation for its history, its heritage, and all things dinosaur. Here, the Lodge pays special tribute to one of its more generous benefactors, that being Clarence P. Wilkerson, and you'll find a special nod to Walt himself and many references to the Rite of Spring segment in Fantasia, perhaps one of the reels on rotation in the makeshift movie theme. And there's even a special spot dedicated to hometown notables Chester and Hester. As the discoveries began causing more and more travelers and tourists to digs, Chester and Hester, realizing the recent uniqueness of their location, began selling dinosaur-themed souvenirs in their service station. Slowly but surely, they began adopting the motif fully, finding it to be much more lucrative than selling gas. They continued transforming their modest gas station into a dinosaur-covered novelty shop and officially converted their store into Chester and Hester's Dinosaur Treasures, a kitschy gift shop for tourists and a gimmicky yet fully adored eyesore for locals. This whole store is very much in line with many roadside attractions. Beginning in the 1950s and 60s all the way up to today, roadside attractions have become part of the appeal of traveling through the country. This dino-themed store was an attraction in its own right, and if you weren't already on the lookout for it, every kind of eye-catching marketing tactic has been played here with countless different puns and zingers covering the structure. Inside you'll find a variety of different dinosaur toys, knickknacks, movie posters, and a whole bunch of cleverly recycled junk. You'll find Hester's dinosaur rock band, and even a pair of Godzillas battling it out over the Coke machine. While Chester and Hester's successful bid to cash in on the Institute's uproar is no secret, a stroll through dinosaur treasures will surely confirm that their love for dinosaurs is genuine. Anybody could spend hours in here finding new things, this whole space is crammed with details and world-building minutia. This gift shop is one of my favorite spots in all of Dinoland USA. The Frozen 2 merchandise kills the vibe a little bit for me, but only, only a little bit. Today, the fishing lodge behind me is more widely known as Restaurantosaurus, a place where interns and professors, motorists and diggers can all come together and buy some high-priced cafeteria food. And there's definitely not as many classes happening there today. That's because over 40 years ago, the Dino Institute got quite the upgrade. Welcome to the newest and improved Dino Institute. The Dino Institute was opened and dedicated on April 22nd, 1978. The space was bigger and cleaner and offered the air of nobility that Dr. Dunn so greatly craved. This new edifice would separate itself from the childish hijinks that were so prevalent in the old fishing lodge. Here in the new establishment, at all times would there be a special tone of diligence, decorum, and dignity. Something Dr. Dunn had a special challenge maintaining in the previous quarters. And thus, it's not a challenge to find sharp differences in just about every aspect of the Dino Institute to the rest of Diggs County. The new and improved Dino Institute had more classrooms and research laboratories as well as becoming more of an official museum for tourists. The Dino Institute would be at the forefront of paleontology and dinosaur discoveries, or at least that was the hope. In spite of great strides being made daily in the study of dinosaurs, the Dino Institute as a whole continued to struggle financially. As the dig sites and research continued to expand, it was clear there was growing appeal in dinosaurs, and yet there was still a lack of sustainable profit for the venture. The Board of Trustees knew that if great changes were not made, it could result in the closure of the program completely. As a unit, they enlisted the help of Dr. Helen Marsh, a financial consultant and academic professional, as the new director of the Dino Institute. Helen Marsh was no stranger to controversy. 
She found her success finding singular approaches to improve museum and university attendance to ultimately capitalize on public interest. At the time of her hire in 1997, she had recently authored the book, Finding the Bucks in the Bones. The Dino Institute reluctantly hoped that by adopting her unorthodox and entrepreneurial methods, the Dino Institute could persevere. I like to um, think about the possibilities and look to the possibilities and go for the possibilities. Everyone was curious as to how Dr. Marsh's leadership would impact the Dino Institute. And naturally, shortly after her appointment, she unveiled the first move in a new direction for the program. After a fledgling research enterprise in Arizona called Chronotech on the brink of a breakthrough lost its largest government grant, Dr. Marsh and the Institute were the first to swoop in with a sustainable offer. Chronotech's mission statement was to utilize technology of the future to aid in the study of the past. And now, with Chronotech as a subsidiary of the ever-growing and esteemed Dino Institute, it seemed that dinosaurs would now be the focus point of that endeavor. The buyout paid off in dividends as less than a year after acquiring Chronotech in 1998, perhaps the greatest scientific achievement of all time, the CTX Time Rover was officially unveiled. The Time Rover was a dynamic transport designed for time travel. It could take teams of up to 12 students and or professors for on-site observation and secure sample collecting. Solely rocks and plants and secondary organic matter. Scholars to this day remain baffled by the tech behind the Time Rover and the how still remains proprietary to the Institute. The strides for the Dino Institute as far as scientific research was incalculable, but Dr. Marsh's ultimate intent was always revenue. And the fastest way she felt to increase percentages was to offer ticketed tours to the past. Almost immediately, promotion of these excursions spread, with Dr. Marsh herself summarizing the outing as, it's fast, it's a blast, and it's in the past. The CTX Time Rover had the ability to go back in time to witness the dinosaurs of old firsthand. Tours to the early Cretaceous period allowed a special and safe adventure for those curious to sightsee. The Institute employed countless safety systems and responsible employees to ensure dependable and harmless experiences. As civilians were granted access to the underbelly of the Dino Institute's research facility, were passed freely by vortex capacitors and varying apparatus. Also notice the red, yellow, and white pipes that display the elemental formulas for ketchup, mustard, and mayo. This is a subtle nod to McDonald's, an early and now former financial advocate for the Dino Institute. Perhaps this is another commercial agreement between Dr. Marsh and McDonald's, as it has not been fully disclosed whether or not the condiments play any kind of role in time travel. For the last 20 years and more, the Dino Institute continues to take guests passing through a nostalgic Diggs County back even further in time. And like any good museum, one must exit through the gift shop where one can buy dinosaur toys in a more distinguished environment. The Dino Institute was bringing a whole new audience to Diggs County, but Chester and Hester, our enterprising local celebrities, had something up their sleeve. They figured out a way to make the new Dino Institute just as lucrative for themselves, and thus we have Dino Rum. Yeah. With the Dino Institute now offering these trans-dimensional joy rides, Diggs County was as popular as ever, and this new discovery brought with it an influx of tourists from all over the world. Business for Chester and Hester's dinosaur treasures continued to flourish, but in the mart of competitive commerce, and perhaps taking a note from Dr. Marsh herself, the name of the game is profit. Any way to make a buck. Chester and Hester owned the adjacent property that for years had been used as a parking lot slash rest stop for those stopping at the store. Most recently, up until this point, a portion of this space had been utilized by the Dino Institute as another dinosaur exhibit for traveling motorists. On the parking lot was the Dinosaur Jubilee and a small fossil preparation lab. Basic tents that housed a variety of different dinosaur exhibits and skeletons, including aquatic and prehistoric life. This area is still represented on a map that has yet to be updated upon the entrance. 
Travelers passing through today don't have to look too hard to see what replaced the Dinosaur Jubilee. Chester and Hester knew the public and they knew America and there's just one simple fact that unites every single one of us red-blooded Americans. Americans love theme parks and Chester and Hester knew this. Especially with Diggs County being relatively close to the Walt Disney World Resort, they knew exactly how to entice these thrill seekers. For years we've had a fascination with amusement parks, simple nausea inducing rides and attractions that pop up at fairs and carnivals. Chester and Hester aspire to offer that whimsy full time. So naturally in a way to compete with the distinguished dinosaur learnedness occurring over at the institute, Chester and Hester quickly had their own response constructed and operating. Dino-rama was going to be completely counter to everything at the Dino Institute. A quick glance at Dino-rama is sure to inspire memories of past vacations, a callback to the roadside attractions one finds while traversing the trafficked highways of middle America, something grand, something out of the ordinary, something striking and noticeable, something sure to make the curious traveler pull over and see what's up. If the cheesy signs weren't enough, perhaps the 30-foot tall dinosaur would do the trick. While Chester and Hester are certainly out to make a buck, they surely are a tidy crew and Dino-Rama reflects that. They strive to make sure that their park is the most pristine of any other roadside fair. But regardless of these efforts, like any highway stop, there's a special knack on display of novelty recycling, and penny pinching is the ultimate name of the game. Finding any way to save a buck and make a buck, the reclaiming brilliance of Chester and Hester is apparent all over Dino-Rama. Converting their beloved camper into a dino diner and an old lamppost into a drinking fountain. Car tires and license plates are retooled as foliage planters. There's parking somewhere, and in comparison to Animal Kingdom's parking prices, it's actually incredibly reasonable. Dino-Rama boasts a handful of basic attractions, including Triceratops Spin, with an emphasis on top. This aerial carousel sends cartoonish theropods soaring happily amidst the shooting meteorites that would soon spell their doom. From a distance, we can observe that the entire figure appears to look like a gigantic tin top. Smaller dinosaurs throughout the journey pop out and join us for our fantastical rotating 90 second tour. Directly across the Dinorama Esplanade is Primeval World, also known as Imagineering's greatest joke. Not to be confused with the Primeval World, or maybe that's the point. Primeval World is Chester and Hester's sarcastic and cheeky response to the high-tech, high-cost hijinks happening across the street at the Dino Institute. Primeval World is a much cheaper, lamer, more flippant, roadside attraction version of Dinosaur. It's quite literally in concept an identical experience where you board a time machine, go back in time, encounter dinosaurs, and narrowly escape the giant asteroid that destroyed most life forms on Earth. Although here the experience seems a whole lot less scary and a whole lot more... spinny. The experience begins in the queue as you pass by the great capacitor that will be transporting you back in time. On closer inspection though, you'll find the high-tech gadgets adorning the mechanism are recycled hubcaps and kitchen whisks. You'll soon board your own time machine and experience a much more zany countdown to extinction. Chester and Hester have filled the rest of Dino-Rama with gaudy carnival games, all of which are puntastic. In spite of this, this is the worst part about the land to me. Not for theming necessarily, but just for principle. It costs a hundred bucks to get in the gate and the pay to play irks me a bit. I hate it over at Pixar Pier too, but my distaste for that aspect of the land is not nearly enough to spoil anything else there. While it's surely a Dr. Marsh inspired tactic, it doubly serves as a loving homage to the meaningless prizes of the county fair. Even though there does seem to be a notable rift between the stodgy professors of the Dino Institute and the merrymaking wits running Dino-Rama, Chester and Hester have kindly allowed the Dino Institute to continue fundraising by letting their interns work the branded vendor carts here. Dino-Rama is your standard roadside cheese. There is charm in its tactful tackiness. 
The task was to develop a cheap theme park, and Imagineers did it better than anyone else had ever done. But the problem of having an intentionally cheap theme park attraction surrounded by other immersive attractions like Kilimanjaro Safaris, Expedition Everest, and of course Pandora, the disconnect is valid. This whole space on the surface is directly contrary to everything that surrounds it, and even objectionable to the original idea that created Disneyland in the first place. But that doesn't discount the rich and detailed world that Imagineers have built here. All credit for Dinoland USA goes to Imagineers. While I want to believe that Dinoland USA is just an epic Imagineering commitment to a funny bit, which it totally is, I think the real backbone behind it is purely budgetary. But who cares? I mean, look at this place up close. So next time you're in Dinoland, appreciate the attractions that are here, but especially appreciate the rich history that Imagineers created in light of cash slashing. And it turned out so well for me. Not everything needs to be Galaxy's Edge to be immersive. I didn't always love Dino Land, but it's something that I appreciate a whole lot more on closer inspection. And honestly, I'd argue in the story that it wants to tell, it's working on a very similar level as every other land in this park. Dino Land is right at home here in Animal Kingdom. Dino Land USA is surely the result of budget cuts, but I have a challenging time trying to think of a specific story or world that has been so specifically realized. Pandora tells a unique story, Galaxy's Edge tells a unique story, and maybe I need to explore these and other areas a bit more, but I can't think of another land with such a rich and detailed history supporting it. While none of this is blatantly expressed to the visitor, all of these clues, these histories, have been laid out plainly for guests to discover within the attractions and the restaurants and the decoration. There are different characters, different events, and different traditions all woven neatly within the layout of the land. There's so much more we didn't cover. We didn't even look at the Olden Gate Bridge, the Cretaceous Trail, Dino Ram at Night, the Dino Institute, Sam Gonzalez, who's actually born in the Boneyard, local radio DJs, Digger and Bonehead, not to be confused with MC Ice Age. And it's definitely no secret in Dino Land that Animal has got it bad for fellow intern Jenny Weinstein. It just goes to show that wherever you are within a Disney theme park, pay attention to the details. Seek them out. Just like the paleontologists and interns of Dinoland USA, with a little digging, there are countless stories and treasures that Imagineers have barely buried for us to uncover. Dinoland USA, like almost every other corner of Animal Kingdom, is an absolute triumph of Walt Disney Imagineering. But if they wanted to convert this whole area to an epically themed Indiana Jones area, which doesn't fit thematically in Animal Kingdom at all. They can work Pandora, but not Indiana Jones, not that I can see. But anyway, if they wanted to do that, bye-bye Dino Land. Who knows, with Primeval World only operating seasonally now, Dino Land USA realistically could someday soon go the way of the dinosaurs. And I think with that, it's the end of the vlog as we know it, and I feel it's time to say so long from Diggs County Explorers. Until next time, we'll see you in the happy place. Bye.